Okay, we are still talking about um, colonial life, but I want to talk about two concepts. Um, one concept would be what I'm going to refer to as deviant women um, in the colonies. And then the other concept, completely different concept, is going to be African Americans in the South. Two completely different concepts. So let's start with our first concept, and our concept is what I refer to as deviant women. Uh, now, if you talk about the term deviant, okay, ter the term deviant is just, it's a term meaning you're not following the norm. Deviant doesn't necessarily mean bad or negative. It just means that you're not following the norms of society. So deviant, in a sense, could be seen as positive for, for some people. It could be seen as negative in some people's eyes, or it could just be taken as neutral, okay? And it really is kind of, in a sense, a perception um, issue, if you want. Okay. But I want to talk about deviant women because in the last lecture on colonial women, I really kind of emphasized or talked about basically what was the norm and what was expected of women, the norm, the normal behavior of women and expectations of women. And that definitely is a definitely a broad, a broad concept, and it definitely is very true. But we know in today's society, we even have people that are, in a sense, are deviant, right, in um, society's behavior. They don't necessarily follow the form or what society says they should do. And that was no different in colonial days. There was definitely women that, in a sense, broke the norm. And so I'm introducing this concept of deviant women, giving you examples of deviant women in this time period. But I want you to take that concept of deviant women and I want you to think about, in a sense, deviant women in the rest of this class and deviant women in the rest of the various time periods because there's always people, women, pushing the envelope and kind of doing what they want to do or what they believe is right. And they push that envelope and they kind of buck the system. You will always have that and people do it in different ways. So I want you to take the idea, the concept of deviant women that I'm introducing here in the colonial time. And I want you to think about that as we go through all the various time periods of this class in this class. Okay, so when you talk about deviant women and basically women kind of defying or going beyond what society sees of them, okay? So you have um, some women asserting their dominance, absur um, asserting their voice, um, not necessarily doing what their family wants them to do. Um, you will have um, women sometimes accepted for that. Their family will go along with it. Their friends or family will go along with it. And sometimes they didn't. Um, there were women that basically, girls, women, that basically left. Uh, they left their community and they went to find work somewhere else. They were, in a sense, kind of starting a new life where they didn't have their past or anything that is associated with them. And they kind of started a new chapter kind of on their own terms. Whether they did it with their husbands slash families, maybe boyfriends, um, or if they did it on their own. Women could usually find work. They would definitely have to work. They could be seamstresses, domestic servants, cooks, that type of thing. But usually you could find, um, women could find work in other ways. So this is definitely one, a, a basic example of how women um, did something beyond the norm. Um, another thing is, is that you'll see women participating in military engagements. We will see that um, down the road a little bit, um, but I want to introduce it. There will also be what's known as Bacon's Rebellion. Bacon's Rebellion will be in the 1600s in, in, in uh, Virginia, and you're going to have basically a rebellion in Western Virginia, and a group of Western Virginian Farmers will basically revolt against the um, governor of Virginia. Um, and there will be women who will be a part of that rebellion. Um, so it's once again, it's showing that women are doing the unexpected, not the norm of what, what women are expected to do.
Okay, now I kind of want to get into more specific women um, as examples of deviant behavior. Um, but I also want to remind you before I talk about a couple of other women, I want to remind you of some women that I talked about in the colonial lecture, because these definitely women would be considered to be deviant women also. You had Deborah Moody of Long Island. Remember that she received a colonial land grant. Um, and she did very well for herself. Um, Elizabeth Diggs of the South um, was a wealthy woman. She possessed a large plantation, a large mansion, and 108 slaves. You had Margaret Brent of Maryland. Um, once again, she also did uh, financially well for herself. She owned over a thousand acres of land. She was a wealthy landowner. She was also a friend of the Governor Calvert of the Governor of Maryland, and she was the executor of his will when he passed away. You have Katharina uh, Brett of New York. Uh, she managed her inherited property. Remember, she had um, a, a gist mill, and after her husband passed away, she basically takes that gist mill and actually expands it, and once again, does extremely well financially um, for herself. So those are some women that I just, I mentioned in the colonial lecture. Oh, two more, sorry, just to remind you. Um, Margaret Phillips um, of New York, she had a general supply and shipping store um, specializing in buying and selling furs. Also, Betsy Ross, remember she basically had the upholstery business with her husband. When her husband passes away, she takes the upholstery business and actually expands it and financially does well for herself. So these are some examples of women not being a part of the norm. Another thing that I would also include, I would also include kind of deviant women, um, would be the Quakers in Society of Friends um, because they were raised in that mentality of equality and they see nothing wrong with the equality of the sexes um, of men and women. Um, they were educated, um, they spoke their mind, um, and they were encouraged to do so in the community. So though that as a group could also be considered deviant. Okay, now getting into kind of new material um, as examples for deviant women. Um, you have a woman by the name of Anne Bradstreet. She was a wife and a mother of eight, um, and she lived in Massachusetts. Um, she did her typical duties of a mother, meaning, you know, doing all the things we talked about in the colonial lecture, basically preparing the food, cooking, um, spinning um, thread into cloth, making clothes, taking care of eight children. Um, doing all the things that she was supposed to do. And when she was done, okay, when her day was complete and she could steal away a few minutes or an hour or so in the evenings, um, she would write. And um, what she would write is she would write books, she would also write poetry. Um, this time period, I would say, is about 1620. Um, uh, the time for Anne Bradstreet. Um, so the books that she wrote, she wrote A Good Wife, God's, wait, A Good Wife, God's Gift. Okay, and that's one book. Another book is, um, no, 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 let's see. I'm sorry. A Good Wife, God's Gift. And then the second book, sorry about that. The second book is Marriage Duties. Um, so in a sense, she was living a life of a very typical woman but she wasn't typical because she was writing. And you don't see that of women at this point in time. Um, so she wrote that. Then, um, 1650, um, a, book, a book of her poems will surface. So beyond writing those books, she actually wrote a huge amount of poetry. Um, and in 1650, a book will be published, The Tenth Muse Lately Sprung Up in America. That's the, entire, that's the title. The Tenth Muse Lately Sprung Up in America. Um, this book is a book of her, um, of her poems. It was actually published by her brother-in-law. Her brother-in-law kind of started to see all these poems and he's like, you should publish these. Um, and so he will actually get the book published. Um, one more book will actually be published. Um, it's called Several Poems Compiled Several poems compiled by a gentlewoman in New England. Now that book is actually going to be published after her death. And once again, it's published by her um, brother-in-law. So she is 
living her life and the things that she talks about, like a good wife, God's gift, that type of thing would be a very typical woman thing. But she's not typical because she's this published author. Um, and, uh, and then she does a huge amount of poems. Um, so once again, this is a good example of a woman definitely being deviant. She's not following the norms of society, but it definitely wouldn't be seen as negative. It would actually be seen as positive. Um, now, another woman we have to talk about, definitely um, deviant, but definitely in a different, in a different Definitely a different way. Um, a woman by the name of Anne Hutchinson. Um, Anne Hutchinson and her husband, William, will arrive um, from England in Boston. They'll arrive in Boston in 1634. Um, Anne and William are very devout Puritans, and they come to Massachusetts to basically live the Puritan life. Um, I would say that they are middle class um, couple, family. Um, I have it somewhere. Maybe I don't have it. Um, Anne will have something like 14 kids, I believe. So once again, very kind of typical lifestyle. Anyway, um, Anne is very well versed. She's literate. She's very well, well versed in the Bible and in the um, Puritan religion. When she comes to Boston, uh, they definitely make a, a life for themselves. They get settled. Um, and she herself personality-wise, is a very intelligent woman, but a very outspoken woman. Um, once they get settled, um, she'll be very outspoken on the Bible. She will actually have like Bible meetings in her home. And that was definitely not accepted in Puritan society. Um, a, it's a woman doing it. A woman shouldn't be doing that because she shouldn't be speaking her mind. She shouldn't have thoughts on the Bible reading. But also what it's doing, it's undermining the work of the Protestant minister. The Protestant minister is the one at church that's going to discuss the Bible and the Bible readings. You shouldn't really be doing it at your home. But Anne, okay, will have her own Bible meetings. So she had people that will come to her house, men and women, that will come to her house for Bible meetings. Um, the church, and I should say she actually has a pretty large following. Um, the church, when they find out about it, they will tell Anne to stop. They will basically kind of give her a chance and say, you got to stop the meetings. And she is like, yeah, 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 whatever. And she never does. Um, so another, moving on, now that the church is really kind of have Anne on the radar, they realize what she's talking about. And she's talking about, in her Bible meetings, is she's talking about an individual communicating with the Spirit of Christ, meaning like this individual relationship between an individual and the Spirit of Christ. And then she's also inter interpreting um, Bible teachings. So think about it. If you step back from it and you think about it, she's truly undermining a Protestant minister because if she's talking about an individual relationship between an individual and the spirit of Christ, then what's the point of a minister, right? I mean, if you think about it, if you step back and think about it from that point of view. And so the now the church is really ticked off at her. They've already told her to stop. They don't like what she's talking about in her Bible meetings at home. Um, and so what will happen is they will basically um, charge her with heresy. And heresy is when you go against church ruling. So she will be charged with heresy. Now, before we move on with Anne, I definitely have to make sure we're all on, on the same page about a Puritan community. A Puritan community, Massachusetts, New England, is founded, all the colonies are founded, or the New England colonies are founded by the Puritans. So the colonies themselves are founded by the Puritans. So the people who are running those colonies are Puritan, their religious community. So especially Massachusetts is your colonial government, yes, you're gonna have a governor, okay? But your colonial government is actually run by the Puritans. And so it's actually known as a theocracy. You cannot, you cannot separate 
state matters or co colonial matters and church matters. It's all blended together. So you have church leaders and church leaders are a part of the colony and their colonial leaders also. And so you cannot separate the two. And so with Anne being charged with heresy, going against church te teaching, she's going to be brought to court and that is what she's going to be in court for. And so she's, and, and she's being charged and judged basically by the same people, meaning Puritans. And so she's charged for that. Um, they, in court, they will say that she is a, a woman of nimble wit and, and, and active spirit. Nimble wit and active spirit. Um, and when they questioned her, because she had a court, a court, basically a trial, and when they asked her questions, she would respond, and she actually responded with very intelligent answers, but they were not interested in her answers. It doesn't matter what she answered because they just twist her words anyway. And that's why they're you know, really attacking her on nimble wit and active spirit. Um, and she will be um, found guilty of heresy, and her punishment is that she and her family were be were banished from Boston and they were banished from Massachusetts completely. And so this is actually, it's important to see what happens to Anne because she basically broke the rules. But that's what happens when you break the rules in a Puritan community. You basically get banished. You sometimes can be killed, but most of the times they basically banish you. And in the Puritan communities, you follow the rules. And if you don't follow the rules, there are heavy consequences for it. So she definitely was a deviant woman, okay? And it depends on your view of it, if it's positive and negative or neutral, okay? Um, as I mentioned, she and her family were banished from Massachusetts. So she and her family will go live in Rhode Island, uh, the colony of Rhode Island, for a period of time. And then they will actually move into upstate New York, kind of like, like around the Albany area. Um, and when they're in the New York, upstate New York area, um, there will be an, uh, a Native American raid of their property and her entire family will be killed. Um, and so, I, in a sense, that's kind of the end of Anne Hutchinson. Um, but Anne Hutchinson's legacy is really talking about a woman's place in society and the Puritans were not going to have any of it. Um, okay. Um, Sorry about that. Sorry about that. My computer froze. Um, now, another example of deviant, um, deviant behavior. Now, this is going to be in general. This isn't necessarily, there are definitely individuals, but I'm going to speak about it as a general concept and general comment as, as, um, um, as a defiant or a deviant. Um, now, women, when we're once again, we're going to be in Massachusetts. Once again, Massachusetts being a Puritan community, you follow the rules, and it's a very religious community. Um, there is going to be this wave, and it is like 16, 1640s, 1650s-ish. You're going to get this wave that comes over into the English colonies. It's mainly, or it's basically in the New England colonies, your Puritan colonies. Um, and you're going to have this wave of witch trials and waves of accusations of being a witch. Now, before we get into that, I want you to understand that this is going on in Europe. Europe is having the same issues, definitely on a very large scale. And they will have basically witch trials and what's known as witch hunts um, in Europe. And you will have hundreds, probably thousands of people that will actually be executed uh, for being witches um, in Europe. And so that is going on and it's coming over into the, in, and it's basically spilling over into the colonies. But where you see it predominantly is going to be in Massachusetts and the New England colonies in, pure, in the Puritan communities. Why? Because your Puritan communities, as we know, is a, religious, is a religious colony. And the worst thing that a person can, or something that could be said about a person, is that they have the devil within them or they're doing the devil's work. That is the absolute worst thing 
that could be said about a person or a, a person could be accused of because that is everything the Puritans are living against, right? Or tr they're trying to do God's work, which is against the devil. And so that is the absolute worst thing. And that's exactly what's happening with majority of women or majority of the people will be women, will they be, be accused of witchcraft. When you're accused of witchcraft, you're basically being accused of doing the devil's work. So, um, as I said, starting about 1640-ish, you start to see the witch trials um, starting in about 1650. The height of them is 1650 into 1660s, okay? And then it's kind of starting to die out. It'll, you'll still be hearing about it in 1690s, but there's like a height, the time period, the height where you see it, and that's the height of it. Now, I'm going to talk about um, Salem, Massachusetts. Salem, Massachusetts is basically a small little town in Massachusetts, but they have a very high incident rate of witchcraft and accusations of witchcraft and a lot of witchcraft trials going on in, Mass in Salem, Massachusetts. You will have witchcraft trials in Massachusetts all over the colony, but there tends to be this high percentage in Salem, Massachusetts. Okay, um, so um, when you talk about the witchcraft trials, okay, um, it starts out with um, the Putnam family. And the Putnam family is middle class, I would say maybe upper middle class, and they have this daughter, Ann Putnam. She's kind of like that tweenager. She, she's kind of like that 12, 13-ish, right on the edge of, of being a teenager. Um, and she will, Ann Putnam, will accuse a couple of older women of being witches. Okay, now, one more thing before we move on. The Putnam family has a servant, um, basically a slave servant. Her name, her name goes down um, as Tabitha in like American history books. Her name is Tabitua. And um, it, sometimes she goes down as Tabitha. But she's actually from the, um, from the Caribbean. And in the Caribbean, they have the practice of voodoo. And so Tabitua will bring in this, this idea of, of voodoo and the girl, Ann Putnam, will learn about these, you know, kind of things that you do in, um, in voodoo. And so it is believed that Ann will get some of these ideas, kind of learning it from, from Tabitua, okay? But anyway. Anne's going to basically accuse um, a, basically a widow woman of witchcraft. And she will say that she saw this woman levitating from the bed. Um, and the woman was like speaking in tongues. Okay. Now, obviously, you will say that a normal people, a normal person cannot levitate and they don't speak in tongues. This will kind of kick off the... Um, the witchcraft trials in um, Salem. Um, so this woman is brought up and accused of witchcraft. Um, and she'll say, I'm not a witch. You know, this is crazy. I'm, I'm not a witch whatsoever. And then some other people will actually basically try to defend this woman and say, she's not a witch. You know, I've known her all my life. But she's not a witch. And then the court will turn around to her friends and say, well, you must be a witch also if you're defending your friend who is a witch. So then other people get brought in because they defend somebody who's being accused of witchcraft. And so what starts out as a few people then snowballs into a lot of people within Massachusetts because people will come to defend her or, or to defend another person. Okay, and then when you look at who's being accused of witchcraft, it's majority of people are women, but there will be a small percentage of men that will also be accused of witchcraft and some very few men, but um, a few men will actually be, be found guilty of witchcraft. Um, the men that get drawn into it is because they're defending women and then they get accused because obviously you're defending a witch, so that makes you a witch yourself. Um, so, um, the accusations, um, we know what happened with Ann Putnam, but people will say they see people levitate off the ground, uh, they speak in tongues, 
um, they were around a cow and they touched a cow and the cow died the next day. So obviously then that person has to be a witch. Um, and it, they'll, it's like stuff they can't explain, right? Or maybe perhaps made up, but okay, that was back then. Um, and so women will get accused. Now, when women get accused of witchcraft, there's very, it's really hard to defend yourself because no matter what you say, the court is basically going to twist words, your words, and basically they kind of know what they want before they actually get into trial. Not all women are executed. There will be some women that are executed. Um, some will actually basically go to jail and go to jail perhaps for a lifetime or for a period of time. Um, another thing which, with witchcraft, and this was just a decision within the court, is they would basically do, in a sense, what's referred to as a trial beyond a trial. And they'll say, um, we're gonna throw hot oil on you, and if you survive, that means you're not a witch. You're able to overcome that, and you're not a witch. Um, but if you die because of your burns, then obviously you're a witch, okay? Um, and then another one is that they would um, tie stones around a pe uh, people's feet or women's feet, and they would throw them in the ocean. And if they drowned, then obviously they were a witch. And if they did not drown, then they weren't a witch. Um, obviously, um, surviving those types of trials, um, it would be miraculous if you survived those things back at that period of time. A couple of women did. Um, and then, then you were then obviously not a witch for that. I mean, but it's crazy thinking. But back then, they would say, if you're not a witch, then you're going to survive it. And then they have a reason why you don't survive it. Now, um, when you look at, for me, okay, the biggest picture is when you go back and historians go back and they look at the Salem witch trials, um, and this is historically, they start to see kind of, they start to see patterns. They start to look at the women who were accused, and the women who were accused, a lot of them were widows, and widows had to speak for, up for themselves because they had no one else to speak up for themselves. Um, they perhaps were working and women shouldn't work, um, but they had to because they were widows. Um, they, um, you will see women who were accused of witchcraft had actually made claims in court. They had made claims in court about property lines um, and they were widows who made claims in court about property lines and they were trying to defend what was theirs. Um, women who were charged were women who spoke out within the community. You were not supposed to do those things in a Puritan community. And so you're going to be attacked for that. And in a sense, perhaps put in your place. And women should know their place in society. Um, for me, that is kind of the biggest thing coming out of the witch trials. Um, the Salem witch trials as a... Um, as an overall kind of example of the rest. I truly believe that the witch trials were about putting women into place, even if things were made up, that type of thing. Now, the Salem witch trials are gonna to start to die off, as I mentioned, uh, 1660. And what happens is that um, there's some um, prominent women in Salem that start to get accused. And once prominent women um, kind of the favorite people in society get accused. Um, people within the court system are like, oh no, it can't be her. There's no way that's her. This is absolutely ridiculous. And we're not even gonna file charges. Like this is ridiculous. And then you kind of start to see it die down, which is interesting because when the non-favored people of society were accused, there was no question. But when well-established women, prominent women were accused, oh, it can't be. So I definitely think that there was something, a social, economic, a social aspect of the Salem witch trials. And so once again, that's why I put it as a uh, deviant. Okay, now moving on to, um, moving on to one, I think one last example of a deviant woman um, to kind of bring us back to a positive note um, is going to be a woman in Charleston, South Carolina. Charleston, South Carolina, you're going to find Eliza Lucas. Eliza Lucas was born into a very wealthy family in Charleston, South Carolina. 
Her father was actually the governor of, Antigu of Antigua. Antigua is an island in the Caribbean. And so he spent um, basically kind of part of his time in Antigua and part of his time in South Carolina. And the issue is, is that her mother is going to fall ill and her mother cannot manage the plantation. Um, the very large plantation that they have. And so Eliza Lucas, who's 17 years old, this is 1739, she's 17 years old, um, she is actually going to have to step up and basically manage the family plantations. In actuality, they will have three plantations. And Eliza Lucas will actually manage three plantations. Um, she will learn accounting. And first of all, she was literate. She was educated because she's from a wealthy family. Um, but she'll learn accounting, she'll learn bookkeeping, she will also learn and study about the cultivation of crops. And so she becomes very educated to be able to run the plantations. One of the things that she is actually going to do, and I should say that they were, um, they were farming rice at that point in time. Uh, her plantation or her plantations uh, was definitely uh, uh, farming uh, rice at that point in time. But she will hear about another crop, and that's indigo. And indigo is, I, it's basically kind of this stock, stocky plant. And what's interesting about indigo, indigo is that you take the stock of the plant, and basically the, um, um, I'm going to call them juices. That's not the word I want. The um, kind of the moisture from the plant um, has like a bluish, purplish color to it. And so indigo is actually um, wanted to be as a crop because they wanted to take the dye from the stalk of the plant and you would basically use that dye to dye clothes. But what's really important is that royalty in Europe at this point in time, that is the color of royalty. It's kind of like your bluish purples um, was what was used by, the, by royalty. And so if you can have an indigo crop, right, and export this plant and export the dye of it, um, it's going to be highly wanted, in highly wanted, highly needed in Europe, and it can become a really good crop. Eliza Lucas is kind of learning about this, and she's like, I want to plant indigo. So that's exactly what she does. Um, she is going to plant indigo. And indigo is actually going to do very well. She kind of did her homework and the crop does very well. Um, by 1744, she will have her first very strong, large crop of indigo, and she is able to make good money off of it. After that, she is then going to teach other people within the colony, as in i.e. men, on how to grow indigo. How to grow indigo. Um, and so she will definitely expand her family's farming, and she will expand it size-wise, and she'll also expand it financially-wise. And so that's definitely a really good example um, of a woman who really isn't letting society uh, dictate uh, where she was going, and she, she and her family will become very wealthy. All right, so that is basically my, um, my um, lecture on deviant women. Um, I want to talk about another concept, uh, moving on, completely different. Um, and I do actually realize I want to talk about one other thing very briefly before I get into African Americans. Um, I want to talk about women, lower class women, um, lower class white women in the colonies, whether it's north or in the south, it does not matter. Um, this would be the poor. Uh, the poor working class, the poor working class that have to work to absolutely survive. Um, and my whole point is, is with this is like, what are they doing? They will take any job at any wage. Um, but you see them being the laborers. Uh, they're taking labor jobs, um, cooks, servants. A very, another popular one was washerwoman, basically doing laundry. Um, um, and that was the only way they would survive. They might be single and have to survive that way, or you might actually be married and have a family, um, and it's just a poor economic family, and um, both men and uh, husband and wife have to work, and they basically kind of have to work outside the home to survive. Um, when you talk about children from this poor class, Obviously, the children are definitely going to be set up into a cycle of poverty, and that's exactly 
the direction the kids are going to go into is basically when they get old enough, they're going to work with mom and dad and then just be, that will be what they do. Um, but also you will have a situation where the family can't even take care of their children um, and they will put them up for adoption because they can't afford to take care of their own kids. Um, another one is they will bound them out as servants um, when they get old enough to work. And it's not, I don't know, I want you to think it's slavery, um, but they're making a deal with, say, a family that this child will be a servant. Um, and either that child will get paid a little bit later when they're starting to do a little bit work, or they might actually sign a contract where that child would be a servant um, with no fee involved for X amount of years. And that might be the only way that that family feels that that child can survive because the deal is the child wouldn't get paid, but they would be fed and they would have a roof over their head. Um, <clears throat> and so you definitely have them in really tough situations. Um, but unfortunately, in those lower economic situations, people do what they have to do to survive, which is very sad when you think about it from that, from, from that perspective. Okay, now I'm going to move on and talk about my last um, concept that I want to talk about, and that is African Americans um, in the colonies. Um, and when you talk about African-American women, I'm definitely focusing, right, obviously because of the class. So African-American women, um, records, records show from the London company um, that the first boatload of Africans will come um, in, um, into Jamestown in August of 1619. And it is, on this document, it shows 20 Africans. Uh, that will come over. And when they're coming over, um, they're coming over as slaves. Now, um, those numbers, once that first boatload will come, they will start, they will continue to come, and the numbers will increase as, as the years, in, as the years pass by, they will definitely um, be increasing in number. Um, <clears throat> when you talk about the years 1619 to 1750, um, all colonies had legalized slavery. <coughs> Excuse me. All colonies um, between 1619 and 16 and 1750, um, all colonies had legalized slavery. And also with the slavery that was in the America um, or in the colonies, um, the type of slavery or the situation of slavery is that the offspring of the slave would automatically be a slave. Um, that is for the most part, unique to slavery in the Americas. Um, when you talk about 1648, I have a number. Um, an estimated slave population in, po in Virginia was about 300. Um, so they're kind of slowly coming over, but as the years progress, you'll have more slaves that come over. Um, we talked about that. So 1661, I've kind of already mentioned it. Um, it is actually written in the books. There's legalized slavery and that children would follow their mother's condition. So if the mother was a slave, then the child would be free. If a child would be a slave. If the mother was free, then the child would be free. So it's basically following in the condition of the mother. Um, by 1735, Georgia will actually ban slavery, although it will be very difficult to enforce and it's really not enforced. Um, it will then, it'll only last for 14 years. Um, by 1750, um, slavery will be made legal again. Um, when you talk about slaves coming over um, on ships, it's an estimated, and it's definitely a wide estimation, but anywhere from 10 to 50% will die um, during the Middle Passage, basically on the ship from Africa to the Americas. Um, there were definitely poor conditions on the ship. They didn't feed them very well. They didn't give them a huge amount of water um, and food, and then you get sick. And if one person gets sick, basically everybody gets sick. Um, um, and so you're definitely going to have a high death rate. Okay, um, when you talk about slavery in the colonies, slavery is definitely going to flourish um, because there was definitely a labor shortage and there was a definite need for um, labor. And so 
they're looking for, in a sense, kind of a cheap labor source, and they will go in the direction of slavery. And once slavery kind of takes hold, it will definitely stay. Um, you will have, as I mentioned, um, Bacon's Rebellion. Um, Bacon's Rebellion is going to be in Western Virginia, and Bacon's Rebellion is going to be this rebellion um, because Western farmers don't like what's going on in Virginia uh, politically, and so they will revolt against the, um, the governor. But the issue is, is that there will be indentured servants as a part of that rebellion. It has nothing to do with the indentured servants. They're just helping out their farmers that they're working for. Um, but what it does is it puts a great fear in the colonists. They're like, oh my God, there's indentured servants in Bacon's Rebellion, and oh my God, we fear them. And because of that, they will fear indentured servants. Indentured servants as a labor source will die out, and slavery had already been introduced into the colonies, and so they will just choose to go the route of slave labor versus indentured servant. Indentured servants labor will die out, and then you will be left with slave labor, and then slave labor will just increase. Okay, when you get talking about women, um, women's work, um, African-American women's work, or African-American Africans that come over, um, definitely viewed um, um, as strong workers. They will work almost everything and anything. You'll have um, women that will be, in a sense, household slaves, but you'll also have field hands, and you'll have field hand slaves. Um, so they can work in any type of setting. Okay. Um, on an average, in this beginning, when you're talking kind of uh, 1600s, probably into 1700s, early 1700s, um, early 1700s, so 1600s, um, slave women had an average of about three children. Um, and you have to remember that not all children will make it into adulthood. Um, obviously, there's a definitely high death rate with the slaves whether they're adult or children, um, but you will definitely see it having to do with children. So in the 1600s, average um, slaves would have, or slaves would have an average, average of three children, not all making it into adulthood. Um, it all depended on the masters. Some masters welcomed women to become pregnant and have children, and some did not. It kind of depends on the view. Um, some masters thought, saw it as, oh, well, my slave will get pregnant and then I'll have another slave. And, you know, definitely years in the making, but I have spent no money on that. So you'll see that, and some masters will actually encourage it. Um, some masters will say, well, when she's pregnant, then she's not going to be a good worker. She won't be a strong worker and will actually not want that. So it just kind of depends on the view of the master. Um, when you talk about women, um, some slave women definitely did not want to get pregnant or definitely tried to um, discourage it. Um, there was definitely uses of, um, of abortions. It was mainly herbal abortions. Um, also some means of contraceptives, once again, like herbal contraceptives, um, because some women definitely didn't want to bring children into the world that they were in. Um, but once again, when you talk about the um, means at this point in time, they didn't always work. Um, so you could try it that way, but it didn't always um, it didn't always um, work out that way. Um, 1720s, um, 1720s. You're definitely going to see um, women having more children. Um, the average slave would have um, eight to nine children on average. Remember, not all of them are going to make it into adulthood. Um, and so, when you talk about numbers of slaves, um, 1740. Um, I have numbers of 23,958 slaves in the North, 23,958 uh, slaves in the North, same year, 1740, you'll have 126,066 slaves in the South. Um, same year, 1740, you'll have 126,066 thousand and sixty six slaves in the southern colonies um, and those numbers will just increase as the years go by a because you'll have the slave trade but you'll also have slaves having children okay um 
slaves in your northern and middle colonies. Um, they worked on farms, they worked in um, the household, they worked as domestic servants, um, cooks, laundresses, just do it, basically doing the household chores. You also might see them working on farms um, a little bit. The thing is, is that when you get into the middle and northern colonies, basically above Maryland, so anywhere I would call it like, um, like Pennsylvania on up, um, your middle colonies would be like Pennsylvania, uh, New York area. They will have farms. They do tend to do a good amount of farming. Um, so you will have farms, um, but you also will have family farms. And if you have family farms, you don't have huge acreage. So the whole thing is you don't need a whole lot of labor source for those smaller farms. If you have a larger farm, Pennsylvania and New York, then you might see slaves on the farm. Um, but a lot of times you see them in the home. But another thing is you will also see them in businesses. You'll see them working as alongside a master and they might be a carpenter, they might be a printer, they might be a blacksmith. Um, the same slave that I have mentioned in this, the Salem Witch Trials, uh, Tabitua, um, she actually was a weaver. And so she will actually be hired out at some point in time in her life, and she will actually work or be working as a weaver. And so you will actually see when you're talking in the northern colonies, middle and northern colonies, you will actually see slaves that will actually be working kind of in an occupation. Um, but it's basically providing a service for a family. If that's true, you don't see the same amount of slaves that are in the North and as in the South because you just don't have the need for them or you don't have the need for a huge amount of them because you're working in small family um, businesses and you might only need like one or two or even in the home, you might only need like one or two. And then even if you're talking about farming, the, the farming's not so large scale that you need so many um, slaves. Okay, um, so you've got that. Um, now, when you're talking about the North, there might be some chance of education in the North. There is a little bit more willingness kind of here and there. Um, the Trinity Church, the Trinity Church in Pennsylvania um, will actually provide education for um, slaves. This is 1704. Um, you'll also see schools. Um, one school is associated with the Trinity Church, but you will see schools that will open up in um, Pennsylvania, New York, and New Jersey. Definitely hit and miss, okay? Providing education and opportunities for education. But if you see the possibility, it's definitely going to be in the North. Um, Lucy Prince. Lucy Prince was a slave. Um, she was educated by her owner, and she will actually become a poet. Um, in 1746. Now, having said what I've said, it is still, it is illegal for a slave to know how to read and write, to be literate. But there are some people that don't necessarily agree with that, and they want their slaves to have education. And so there are some opportunities. You kind of have to look for them. They're kind of hit and miss, and they would definitely be in the North. Okay, when you move down into um, the South, Okay, um, and you're talking about slaves in the South. As I mentioned before, uh, domestic work, right? Cooking, sewing, midwifery, um, um, running the household, taking care of the children. Then if you move outside, definitely as field hands, you also see them as like dairy maids, basically milking cows. Um, so you will see them doing all types of work. But they can actually become very skilled doing what they do. You might have a slave who's a really great cook, and that will be what she really focuses on. You might have a slave that has a lot of sewing skills, um, and she'll be an, ex an excellent seamstress. Um, some of them will become midwives, um, and sometimes they work as a midwife, and they are actually sent out as a midwife, and it's the master that gets paid for the, sla the, labors, uh, the slave labor. Um, but that is in another skill that they will have. Um, when you're talking about the fields, um, field slave, uh, very long, hard hours working out in the elements, usually working from sun up to sundown, um, extremely hard labor, um, and kind of backbreaking work. 
Um, but every once in a while, you'll hear about a caption of a woman saying, um, I did everything on the field except loading the bales of hay. So there definitely was a little, some work that women didn't do, and I think it was more of your bo upper body strength um, that you'll not see a woman doing, at least on some farms. In the South, education was pretty non-existent. Um, there might be a few masters here and there that will teach their slaves how to read. And if that happens, it's usually because the master wants the slave to know religion and they want the slave to know the Bible. Um, and so you might see that. Or if the, when you have kids, right, whether slave kids or the master's kids, and you have kids that are the same age, um, they will actually play together. Um, when they're very young. And if the master's children are learning their ABCs and their numbers, um, sometimes that is translated indirectly, uh, not purposely, to the slave children. And so maybe the slave children can kind of pick up things a little bit here and there. Okay, um, slave communities, uh, families and communities, their life completely depended on the master. Um, a master could be very harsh or a master might not be as harsh. And so completely dependent on the master and the master's life. Um, women, or it doesn't, in a sense, it's men and women. Um, slaves would definitely make a life with their own family. Um, and they create a culture and they create a life with their own family, obviously dependent on the master. Um, and um, it was definitely a very hard life in raising the children. Um, but they always face the fear of their family being broken up. That's one thing that masters would do is basically tell the parents, if you don't behave, I'm going to break up your family. I'm going to take your kids. I'm going to send you away. And uh, basically, the, the parents obviously will do everything and anything to basically keep their family intact. Um, um, whether or not you have a family or whether maybe your family has been broken up, and let's say a child comes into a farm, um, what the slave community will do will adopt that child and basically raise that child on their own. And this is really the beginning of this kinship, this uh, kinship network. And they raise that child as, of their own. Or perhaps they just look out for other slaves and they watch each other's backs. Even though they're not related, they're blood related, they're basically as close they're as close as family because that they've created their own family um, by taking care of one another. And this is where you get this, um, it's called a kinship network. And they basically take care of one another. They raise children that are not their own as their own. And it's the way that they survive. It's the way that they just have a family and the way they survive. Um, also, women are definitely going to come together to take care of one another, um, basically taking care of each other in pregnancy. If somebody's having a bad day, somebody's going to take up the slack for them. Um, when they actually do um, have childbirth, it's the other female slaves that are going to basically kind of be a midwife, um, take care of that woman. Also, taking care of the kids. You kind of all kind of pass your kids around, and if somebody needs to get a lot of work done, then you kind of give your kid off to somebody else, um, and you basically watch each other's backs, and you take care of one another, and you take care of one another's kids, um, and you take care of each other when you're sick, because really, your fellow slave is the only person that's going to look out for you. So women really definitely do that, and they really definitely take care of one another. Um, but also you have very positive things like um, religious practices of singing, of cooking together, of celebrating celebrating whatever is going on in each other's lives. That's what the slave community is going to do with each other. Um, another thing, um, when you talk about the women... Um, they definitely are going to have an extensive knowledge of um, medicinal medicine. They will definitely know the herbs, what herbs you can use, what herbs you can't use, what herbs you use for what type of illness. Um, and they do a lot of herbal medicine. Um, some of that definitely comes from Africa, but it's something that is kind of an acquired knowledge that they will learn in the Americas. Um, talk about that. Um, another thing is, is that women, if 
once again, if you can find the time, um, slave women will do extra things and kind of maybe work maybe on Sunday when they wouldn't normally work. Uh, they would might cook more. They might make more apple pies or more biscuits and actually sell it. They might um, make some clothing. They might grow extra fruits and vegetables in a little garden beside their house. Um, and then they sell it for a way to, for them to actually make money. And the idea ultimately is to make more money so you can buy your freedom. Um, also, you might actually, with your master's approval, might go work on your day off of Sunday and you might go do washing or help another family out and you actually might get paid a little bit for that. Once again, dependent on your master. Um, Another one is in South Carolina, you'll have the Negro Act in 1740, which permitted slaves to represent their owners in buying and selling of produce and other goods. So it allowed the slaves to actually go run errands for their master, kind of get them out of the property, um, and they could actually like go and buy things. Um, I have that um, Negro Act of 1740. <laughs> but you'll also see that in um, other colonies as well as slaves um, are basically doing like going grocery shopping for their masters. Sorry about that. My throat's dry. Okay, um, just a couple other concepts and then I will be done. So hold on. Um, you're going to have um, resistance like slave resistance. Slave resistance came in all forms um, like a slowdown, work slowdown, uh, misunderstandings, running away, uh, violence, um, sometimes arson, very rarely but every once in a while you hear about that. The most popular forms of resistance is like slowdown and kind of misunderstandings or playing dumb. Um, somebody will say they'll ask a slave a question, oh I don't know, no I don't know. They know exactly what they're talking about. They just don't want to be helpful. And it's their way of saying, I'm not going to help you. And, oh, I don't know, go ask someone else. Another one is slow down, is that they'll be working in the fields and they'll be working, but they'll do it slowly. And there's nothing that the, they can say. It's like, I'm working, do you see I'm working? I'm working. Or perhaps they'll break a tool and they'll take the long way around and then they take the long way around and they'll, oh, no, 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 I'll fix it. And they do fix it. And then they take a long way around. And, you know, the whole event probably took like an hour and a half. But it was a way of them resisting of kind of being in control of what they're doing, which they don't have a whole lot of control over their lives. So those are like everyday forms of resistance. Um, um, also common, but probably not every day, running away. They'll have the Underground Railroad, um, which helps slaves run uh run away from the south and to the north, but just flat out running away. Um, violence, you'll see um, rebellion. Um, you'll see attacks on a white family or a white community. Once again, they do happen. They don't happen every day. Arson, every once in a while, you'll read about arson. A slave will set a building on fire. Um, many times with arson, the slave definitely gets caught. Also with the violence, um, as slaves usually get caught with that too. Um, okay, um, an example, 1740 Charleston, Massachusetts, a slave by the name of Kate was executed for setting the house on fire. So that was an example of it. Okay, now one other, two other concepts and we'll be done. Um, free, free black, free blacks, and you do will have what's referred to as free blacks. You will have Africans that will come over to the colonies, never as slaves. They might come over as indentured servants or they come over to the Americas basically looking for another life, a better life, a different type of life. Um, although when, you, and when you're talking about um, women in our case, okay, um, there are definitely going to be a, an amount of them that will come over, small amount, small percentage. As I mentioned, a good amount, of, I would say a fair amount of the small percentage uh, would be coming over as indentured servants. They work their four, seven years. When their contract is done, they are free people to to live their life. Um, others might have bought their freedom. Perhaps they ran away um, or and then went into the north or went somewhere else and were able to kind of get away from society and were free. Others might be able to buy their freedom and they would actually get a piece of paper saying that they're free. And they always carry that paper around with them to show that they're free. Um, 
Every once in a while, a master might free their slaves. I would say this is a little bit on as the years go by. Um, George Washington freed his slaves. It was in his will that on the death of Martha, his wife, his slaves would be free. So you will see that every once in a while. I would not say that's like a common occurrence, but it definitely happens every once in a while. The whole point is, is you're going to have a free black community. Um, what do they do? They usually live in a community to themselves. Um, you will actually, surprisingly enough, see a good amount of them in the South, in the, um, New Orleans, uh, Charleston, South Carolina will also have one. Okay. They kind of had this community unto themselves, usually right off the side of a major city. Uh, they created their own businesses. They always looked behind, they were always looking behind their back. But the fact is, is that they will make a life and they will continue to make a life and will survive as free blacks. Uh, very small of that, a very small percentage will actually like work land because they really can't buy land. It's usually businesses or become laborers. Um, in Pennsylvania, um, 1740, um, their slaves will be emancipated. Um, this is because the Quakers did not necessarily believe in slavery, and as the times go, as the time went by, they really questioned the morality of it. And by 1740, Pennsylvania will actually free their slaves, and so they will get rid of slavery. They'll be one of the first colonies to do so. Okay, um, mulattoes, um, children from interracial unions. Um, there definitely were laws against it. There were laws against. Um, the whites and the blacks basically having a relationship, let alone getting married. Um, but every once in a while, it did happen. Uh, love happens and kind of love overtakes it. Um, but another instance would definitely be more of a negative um, relationship. And that would be with a, um, a slave woman and the master. And it was basically a forced relationship. Um, and you will have obviously children that will become a result of this. Um, but remember that a child will be the condition of her mother. So with that, if you have this relationship between a master, an unwanted relationship between a master and a slave woman, um, the child would be automatically be a slave. Now, how that child was treated, it all depends. It completely depends on the master. Um, that child could get a little bit easier of a life or that child could have a harsh life because like the missus found out and then the missus is not gonna like that child. Um, so it kind of all depends on the individuals, um, but definitely very challenging life. Okay, I finally did end. Um, and that is the end of the deviant and African-American uh, slave um, lecture. Uh, more lectures to come, bye.